Well, <clears throat> it's good to have you with us today, friends. Um, today, I just want to um, talk about something that I've noticed that many of our uh, up and coming preachers uh, could use a lot of help with. Um, actually, it's the, the subject of uh, ministerial ethics and pulpit protocol actually from the Black Baptist Church perspective. So this is what we're going to deal with. Prayerfully what is said here, uh, brethren, you can discuss with your pastor, but I can assure you um, prayerfully that will help you. So let's jump right into it. Ministerial ethics and pulpit protocol from the perspective of the Black Baptist Church. Let's first of all discuss the uniqueness of the call, the uniqueness of the call. The preacher must understand the uniqueness of the call is very important. You have been called out of the called out ones. The Lord Jesus Christ has found you faithful by putting you in the ministry. In fact, the Apostle Paul says just that in his first letter to Timothy, the first chapter in the 12th verse where the King James Version reads, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now the word enabled is endumanao, endumanao, and it literally means that the Lord Jesus Christ has strengthened you. This strength, brother, is not from you from within, not from you from without, what was placed within you from him who sits high and looks low. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ has in strengthened, that is, you have been inwardly strengthened to stand on the word of God. Look, if you are going to stick to the book, if you are going to be uncompromising, if you are going to, as Paul also told Timothy, to rightly divide, that is to cut it straight in the face of a postmodernistic society, in the face of a culture that has gone mad with being politically correct, if you are going to stand on the word of God and keep to the standards, refusing to bow to the winds of society, then you, my brother, will need strength. Paul says, I thank God because he has strengthened me. The Apostle Paul continues and says, for he found me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Paul says the Lord found him faithful. Paul, the former Saul, who at the time of his calling was wreaking havoc on the early church, God counted faithful, putting him into the ministry. Now the word faithful literally means reliable and trustworthy. Listen. Paul, prior to the call to the ministry, vehemently persecuted the church. Paul, at that time, hated Christians. Paul, at prior to the call, was someone that Christ's followers did not like see coming. They did not like to see Paul coming. What am I getting at? Preacher, I'm trying to tell you that it does not matter what you used to do or how you used to live. Now notice, I said used to live. That's past tense, my brother. It does not matter what you did before mm -hmm. salvation. It does not matter what you did before, before salvation and the call to the ministry because God called you. Your mama didn't call you. Your daddy didn't call you. In fact, you did not call yourself. God called you and counted you faithful. Preacher, listen to me. Not only has the Lord inner strength in you, but he also counted you faithful. Others may deem you unfaithful, but that's okay because they aren't the ones that called you. God called you, and only what he says really matters. Now, since the Lord counted you faithful, you must understand 
you must understand that the ministry of which Lord Jesus has called you to is not to be viewed the same way that secular employments view their occupations. First, ministry is not an occupation, it's a ministry. Why? It is because secular employment can be walked away from without any repercussions. However, the ministry given by the Lord Jesus cannot be laid aside without having the Lord deal with you. Remember Jonah? I guess an argument could be made that if you can walk away from the ministry and never to return, you probably have never been called. Secondly, secular employment measures success by quantity or by the numbers. But the ministry success is measured by your faithfulness. You cannot measure success by how many people come to Christ or how many come to prayer meeting or Bible study. In other words, success is not measured numerically. Success is measured by your faithfulness to the call. Because of the notorious Word of Faith movement, many ministers fall into the thinking of success through numbers. Now, preacher, for those of you with a pursuit to be liked, why is that your aim? Why is that your aim? Why is that your pursuit? Look, I'm not saying to do things purposefully to be hated. Just do what the Lord says under your pastor's tutelage. You're trying to be popular? Consider Jeremiah. He preached for 43 years and no one listened. Noah preached for 120 years. Now, other than his family, not one soul was saved. Yes, Jeremiah and Noah both were faithful. Consider the rest of the Old Testament prophets. Were they all not killed? All? All of them were killed. What about the Lord's disciples? Every single one of them, save John, were murdered for standing for Jesus Christ. Regarding the disciple whom Jesus loved, John, tradition says that an attempt was made on his life, but that he was boiled alive in oil. However, he miraculously escaped because God was not through with him. Yet, Old man John, in God's sovereignty, needed to be banished on the Isle of Patmos where the Lord through him would pen the book of Revelation. Again, Noah, Jeremiah, and the rest of the Old Testament prophets, the Lord's disciples, including old man John, were killed or attempt to be, or attempt to be killed, yet they were all faithful. And who can forget about the man who wrote through the aid of the Holy Spirit 13, and if you give him Hebrews, all uh, 14 books, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. All that Paul did, all that Paul did, and in the end, he died alone. He died alone, think about that. The Apostle Paul, who, very possibly could have written 13 books of the New Testament, again, if you give the Hebrews. He died alone. So preacher, stop trying to be famous. Stop trying to make people like you. Stop trying to make people stand up and holler. Just preach the word and allow the spirit to do what he does while you remain faithful, even under intense pressure and persecution. Let's talk about the preacher and his attire. It is always in order to understand your home church's protocol regarding how you dress. Some pastors require you to have on a dark suit, a tie, and a white shirt. Some pastors require you to robe up whether you are preaching or not. And then others permit jeans, an open collar shirt, and maybe a jacket. The idea is this, respecting the dress code of the church you are in. It is always best to have on a suit and a tie. This way, if you're in a church 
where they don't wear ties, you can simply take it off. One can always dress down from a shirt and tie. Imagine going to a church where they wear suit, tie, and white shirts, and you're wearing blue jeans and maybe a sports coat. Always respect the dress code of the church you are a member of, as well as the one you are visiting. The preacher and his character. Brother preacher, you must understand that others hold a higher level of respect for you, and this should never be taken lightly. Others will often examine your every move and want to know the purposes behind your actions. You as a minister have the same temptations and trials as others. However, yours may come more often and are more intense. The enemy knows that if he can cause the preacher to stumble, others will follow. So be on your guard. Protect yourself from even the appearance of evil. There are some places that are not unlawful for a preacher to go, but are unwise to go. Consider the drive through When you think of drive throughs you think of beer and liquor. Now, me personally, I would not go through a drive through because of how it looks. I can go to a regular store and get me soda pop or potato chips. When I was at New Christian Life several years ago, uh, on Hackberry, down the street, there was a store that was open on Sundays. And after church, I would often go down there and grab me a beverage and some chips or something. And the lady that worked there would take my, my pop, my soda, and place it inside a small brown paper bag. And I thought, you know, this doesn't look too good. Just, just let me take my pop just the way it is. Because if it is inserted down in a bag, someone may think. I'm trying to turn up a 40 ounce or something. Again, protect yourself from even the appearance of evil. Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. There are some places that are not unlawful for you to go, but they are unwise. Remember, you are a servant. The preacher is a servant. He that is great among you, let him be your servant. The way to be used of God is to have a servant's mindset. Never measure an opportunity by any standard. When asked to preach, thank the Lord and the pastor for such opportunities. Do not be concerned about a crowd or do not be concerned about an offering. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't worry about who's there and who isn't there. You go and preach God's word. That's what you do. Proverbs 22 and 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor, favor rather than silver and gold. Guard the use of your name. Be very careful of allowing yourself to be aligned with just any organization. You as a minister are held to a higher level of accountability. And by aligning yourself with an organization, your name can be used inappropriately. For example, when I had gotten to Nuvo almost 18 years ago, I was approached by an organization that was vying for my membership. Now, the organization is not a bad one. However, I do not agree with everything they do or what they stand for. And if there was something that they were trying to push, if they had an agenda that they were trying to push, particular agenda that was contrary to God's word, even though they knew I wouldn't stand for it, they would use my name to promote what they were trying to do. So be very careful of aligning yourself with any group that is opposed to God. I remember several years ago when they were building the new Paul Brown Stadium and there were some preachers down in Cincinnati that were on council pushing to get the stadium. And I'm thinking, Okay, why would you want to push for something that's going to give people an excuse to stay out of church services on Sunday? That just was not a good look. The preacher's physical life. The preacher must take care of his physical body. Some type of light or low impact aerobics can help. He can only preach as his body permits him. Paul said that bodily exercise does profit us. A good balanced diet 
can help preachers as well. Preachers must take care of their vocal cords. Mints and any cold beverage can hurt the vocal cords prior to preaching or singing. Room temperature fruit juice is very good for the vocal cords, so is warm tea. In the winter, it is important to ensure that proper clothing is worn, including hats if necessary to limit the possibility of getting sick, especially after preaching. The preacher and his study. The musician has a studio with equipment. The executive has an office with supplies. The mechanic has his garage with tools, but the preacher must have a study with his tool. The study can be your bedroom, the living room, the kitchen, or any place that lends itself to a moment of seclusion from the phone and family. The study, this study, time can be any time. The study time can be any time. The preacher must plan time for study. The time may be late in the evening, at midday, or early in the morning, wherever or whenever the time is the most quiet, less traffic, and fewer interruptions. Now, preacher, there will be times when the Lord will cause you to move at a time which is not your planned time. He will wake you up sometimes in the middle of the night, post up a scripture, and say, I want you to tabernacle, to pitch a tent right here, read and meditate on my word right here. This is something I am ready for you to catch. Now preacher, there are some things that are taught and some things that are caught. You can learn through a man led of the Holy Spirit. After all, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the teacher. Again, you could be taught from one with the gift of teaching. However, the Lord However, concerning with the Lord, concerning the Lord, things are not taught but caught. Sometimes things are caught, not taught, I should say. Those of you who have, who have experienced this know what I'm talking about. When the Lord taps you on the shoulder and rises you from your sleeping couch, this is not the time to be disobedient and lazy to the Lord's promptings. Follow him. And it will amaze you at what he will allow you to catch for his own glory, not the glory of man and his purpose, but the glory of God and his purpose. The preacher and his prayer life. The preacher is frequently called upon for prayer, counsel, and guidance. But let him not forget his own needs, prayers, and guidance for himself. If the Lord moves you into pastoring, remember this. While tending to the vineyards of others, do not forget to cultivate your own vineyard. The preacher should make a habit of having his own time with the Lord. Let me say that again. The preacher should make a habit of having his own time with the Lord. The Lord Jesus even took time away from the disciples and the crowds even when they were thronging him and reaching for him and grabbing him and needing him, he got away and got to himself along with his father. Preacher, you need to do, you need to do the same thing. The preacher's obligation to home and family. The preacher is responsible for his home and family. He must see to it that his family is taken care of. This may require his work excuse me, this may require his wife, if married, to work in or outside the home. When his wife, wife must work, it would probably be a good idea to sit down and discuss the chores of the home at this point. Preacher, I will caution you against overburdening your wife as this may affect her cooking abilities as well as some other abilities. However, remember, it's the man's responsibility to take care of the home, but the wife is the help mate. 1 Timothy 1, 5 and 8. The King James Version says, If any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now earlier we mentioned that the preacher must not forget to cultivate his own vineyard. This includes time with his wife and children. 
It is very common for the preacher to neglect his family. And this can cause this can cause heartache for the preacher and the church members as well. The preacher must be available for his family and barring any unforeseen extenuating circumstances, if possible, the preacher must not break his dates with his wife and family. I need to say here, regarding churches, particularly any deacons watching and or listening to me, you brother deacon should make sure that your pastor has time for relaxation with his family and time for himself with the Lord. I'm employing the deacon to make sure that your pastor takes sabbaticals. If you want to lengthen your pastor's ministry, then you need to ensure that he gets that. The preacher and his finances. The preacher must see to it that he leads by example in the area of giving. We are expected to give the Lord's money. We cannot expect others to follow if we don't give. Others may look at us as poor examples and follow suit. If the preacher does not give, then why should I? They'll say, giving is an act of faith as well as obedience. As I said earlier, people often are watching the preacher's every move. When the preacher does give, and this goes without saying, be certain that wherever you give, the ministry is viable, reputable, and preferably doing the Lord's work. A ministry I give to regularly is the Pacific Guard Mission in Chicago, Illinois. They host the famous Unshackled radio broadcast. The preacher must see to it that his personal finances are in order. We all get into a bind. Unforeseen medical bills, devastating automobiles, uh, automobile uh, repairs and plumbing can load up on you in a hurry. But try to settle all debts the preacher and his citizenship. Let's talk about specifically civil service. If the preacher is called upon to perform some civic duty, he must keep in mind that he is representing the church of his affiliate and the body of Christ. It is understood that many civic organizations do not have a biblical worldview, but it's a chance to sow a seed. Be aware of the enemy's tactics in causing further division in the body of Christ for the sake of peace. If you are asked a non-consequential question, then the best response is to make no response at all. Church members, as well as people outside your fellowship, will try to get you to go against your pastor or another pastor. Listen. Resist the temptation to respond because it is not your place to do so. Tell your pastor about it and he'll instruct you on how he wants you to be governed in those types of situations. Invocations and public meetings. The preacher may be called upon for prayer. It is very important that the preacher does not compromise his conviction. Sometimes the preacher will be asked to refrain from using the name of Jesus in prayer in order not to offend anyone. If this is understood prior to the actual prayer, then the preacher must decide whether he is going to go forward and do the invocation. Many preachers are divided over this, but I believe the scriptures are clear. Any prayer that is not in the name of Jesus is no prayer at all. The best course of action is to decline from doing the invocation. Politics and social questions. There's much debate about this. Some say no preacher should engage in politics at all. Others say if moral issues are the subject, then the preacher should be involved. Others say that anything affecting the life of the church should be addressed. My position is that any act, be it law or behavior, that affects the cause of Christ and goes against what the Word of God teaches, we should have a voice in God's own time. We should have a voice in God's own time. If something is to be addressed, God will permit time and events to thrust one into the public eye and be a voice for the people of God. These cases are rare, but they can happen. 
the associate ministers and their preaching. Understand this, it is not your pastor's responsibility to let you preach. Let me say that again, brother preacher. It is not your pastor's responsibility to let you preach. I know preachers that all they do is sit around and wait their turn to preach. The same God that called you preacher will provide opportunities for you to preach. There are plenty of street corners where you can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never preach a doctrinal sermon at your home church unless your pastor has given you the thumbs up to do so. Never preach them at any other church because you don't know that pastor's position. Now, I want to caution you, brother. Brother preacher, I want to caution you against preaching pastoral sermons. A pastoral sermon is one that reproves and rebukes. This is not to say that there should not be any preaching against sin, but do not make that the aim because you are not the pastor. Allow the pastor to take the brunt of the complaints from preaching against sin. It is best for an associate to preach messages with the emphasis of exhortation and comfort. But here again, I am not saying that a sermon should not have any rebuking, but do not make the aim. If you do this, if you do this, the congregation that you are a part of will appreciate you more and will support you. If your own home church does not support you, then no other church will. When preaching that exhorts and comforts are preached, the reproving and rebuking will take care of themselves. Remember, you can draw more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. The best way to never get invited to preach at another church is to beat the people where you are in associate ministries where you're an associate minister. Some associates have preached pastoral sermons, sermons that rebuke congregants and even a pastor at home and at other churches, and they wonder why they have never been invited back. Think about that. Now, in the absence of the pastor, say your pastor is on vacation or something has happened, he can't be there, it is unwise to attempt to continue a sermon series that he is preaching. That's a no-no. As a rule of thumb, uh, I suggest that you should preach no longer than 20 to 30 minutes maximum. This is a rule of thumb. I know some who will not, I know some who will allow only 20 minutes at the Western Union Baptist District Association because some preachers, and I'm sorry to say, even some pastors do not exercise good protocol. They are allotted a 20 minute devotional sermon so it can be done. Again, I want to caution you, brother associate, 20, no more than 30 minutes max. To be perfectly honest, I don't care what people tell you, what they whisper to you, to be perfectly honest, the people would rather hear the pastor rather than you. If you preach longer, people will turn a deaf ear and will not want to support you. When they find out that you are preaching, they will not come to church. You can't force people to listen to you. I had one associate that could not seem to get it. He would preach about an hour, fumble with his notes, and just would not listen. Be obedient and exercise wisdom. From the time you stand up, 20 to 30 minutes, the congregation does not need to hear about your dog and cat. Get to the pulpit, get your text, and expound the passage. If you're too long, although they are there in body, their minds will be somewhere else. The Lord will let you know when to stop. And if you don't listen to him, the congregation will let you know. You can't preach people happy, so do not continue preaching with the hopes of getting the congregation behind you and all riled up. Sometimes when they do stand up and clap, it's for you to shut up. Learn to simply land the airplane. Dr. John B. Ivey would tell us that there are three ups in preaching. Get up, speak up, and shut up. In other words, Doc Ivey said, inspire, catch fire, and retire. Pastor Flav Lee Hunter used to tell us, don't make them glad twice. Glad when you stand up, and glad when you sit down. 
whether preaching or not at your home, at your own church, you should be attending Sunday school, which usually starts before morning worship. When you are preaching at another church, it's good to be at least 30 minutes early and be escorted to the pastor's office. Do not take it upon yourself to enter his office without an escort. Respect the methodology of the church you're preaching in, including your home church. It's quite simple. You're not the pastor. Stay with the program of the church. If at home and you want to hear a song, make sure it's okay with the pastor. Perhaps you would like to hear your wife sing. Make sure you clear it with the pastor. When you're preaching at another church, stay with their program. And it's best to do what you're asked. Preached. I do not recommend asking the wife, the choir, or request any group to sing. Just do what you are assigned to do. Preach. This cannot be overemphasized, but regarding protocol at your home church, in the absence of your pastor, do exactly what he has all what always has been done. Stick to the program. If the program says read three verses of the passage, do not take it upon yourself to read four. I remember, I remember on one occasion, uh, our pastor was out getting some rest. In the church, at that time, we had a specific set of passages to be read during the offering. The associate read what was our custom to be read, and all was well until he made this statement. Quote, now the pastor stops right here, but I'm going to read the next verse. Close quote. No. Don't do that. It gives the congregation an idea that the pastor is cutting his name short or not reading enough. You never want to do anything. Preacher, listen to me. Brother Associate, you never want to do anything to make your pastor have a perceived bad appearance. If you do, you will never be used of the Lord to your full potential. If called upon to run the service at another church, when the pastor is resting, take time to understand their protocol. If they have praise and worship, let them have praise and worship. If they have traditional devotion, allow them to have it. If they do altar calls each week, then you need to do an altar call. If they don't, then you don't. When in Rome, do what the Romans do. When you are preaching as an associate, always take time to thank the pastor for the opportunity and be sure to say some truthful good things about his ministry without overkill he will appreciate it it is an honor to speak well of a humble pastor if asked to read scripture do just that do not attempt to exegete the passage do not try to pump and prime the congregation do what you're asked read the scripture and then sit down. There will be times when a certain scripture is requested to be read. Be obedient. The number of scriptures is a matter of debate, but it is, it is best to read no more than 10. Again, people will respect you if you do what you are asked. No more and no less. Let's talk about prayer again. It is important and I'm being careful here. I'm being careful. It is important not to pray too long during altar call. Many people have medical conditions and cannot stand for long periods of time. Be sensitive of the health of others. The preacher does the preacher does not need a long time to pray an effective prayer for others. I've been in churches where pastors, that's right, pastors who have not been trained or are ignorant just have preached a sermon in the prayer. I recall one ought to call prayer lasting 20 to 30 minutes. This is not wise, brothers, and contrary to what you may believe, it does not show how spiritual you are. All right, visiting ministers. Never invite another minister to the pulpit without the pastor's recognition, no matter who it is. If the pastor is in the back, and the visiting minister desires to sit in the pulpit, either bring him back to the study or have him wait until the pastor comes out into the worship. When the pastor is absent, unless you have 
clear direction and approval from your pastor, do not allow a visiting minister into the pulpit at all. When the pastor is there, it's good protocol to see that all visiting ministers partake in the service in some aspect, and if need be, you defer while they are visiting. Now, because of the lack of knowledge, it's best not to allow busy ministers, visiting ministers to do the altar call prayer. Why? Because a three to four minute prayer that an unsound preacher prays may take three to four months to straighten out. If your pastor does not recognize female clergy under no circumstances should any female clergy be allowed in the study, the pulpit, or to be recognized. Now while visiting another church, under no circumstance should you take it upon yourself to enter the pulpit without being asked. Going into the pulpit without being asked is like going to visit someone's house and helping yourself to the kitchen and refrigerator without permission. When I would visit my mom at the house, I would still ask her if I can go in her refrigerator and get me something to drink. In closing, brother preachers, be aware. Beware of the temptation of believing that you can take over a pulpit. That is, beware of any church member or members pumping you up to cause you to think highly of yourself. This is nothing but a tactic of the enemy. For example, regarding preaching, people will pump you up to believe that you are quote, better than your pastor and therefore you should be the pastor. Such misguided sheep will try to make you part of their plan. Preacher, don't fall for it. If you do, I can guarantee you you will not prosper. Your growth in ministry is a direct reflection on your attitude, mindset, and the support toward your pastor. Let me say that again. Your growth in ministry is a direct reflection of your attitude, your mindset, and the support you have towards your pastor. Remember Elisha? Elisha performed twice as many miracles as his predecessor Elijah. Do you know why? It is because Elisha followed closely with Elijah. No matter what Elijah assigned Elisha, Elisha did it in a timely manner. That is, Elisha did what Elijah assigned him when and exactly how he was instructed. Elisha did not take shortcuts. Today's Elisha would be in Sunday school, in prayer meeting, in Bible study, in business meetings, doing any and everything his Elijah has instructed him to do. Now, if you have an issue with your pastor, discuss it with him in private. The issue just might be with you. So before you get sat down from the pulpit, brother preacher, from disrespecting the office of the pastor, save yourself some shame and embarrassment and be wise. Go to him. If you have an issue, go to him in private. Don't stand up on a, on, in a meeting, in, in a business meeting and try to blast your pastor. That is unwise to do. I can assure you, you will never prosper. Talk to him in private. If you want to be Elisha, then you must make sure that your Elijah, who by now we know is your pastor, has what he needs. And if you don't know, asking your pastor works just fine. Two more things here, and this concerns prayer. Remember your pastor in prayer during home devotions and during the altar call prayer. Preacher, don't ever forget this. No one understands a preacher like another preacher, but in the same way, nobody understands a pastor like another pastor. There are some things your pastor does or does not does not do 
allows or will not allow. You may be wondering, why does the pastor allow this or that? Well, my brother, until you are in the seat of a pastor for an extended time, roughly seven years at least, you will not understand. Just be faithful and pray for your pastor even when you do not understand. God bless you, brothers. I like this passage right here. As I pray for you, we get it from Philemon 1 and 4. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayer. Preacher, let's continue to pray for one another. My contact information is right here. If need be, you can contact me. With the Lord's help, I do everything I can to assist you. And remember, I'm praying for you. In closing, let me call your attention to the movie Top Gun. The scene opens with a song entitled Danger Zone. Preacher, you have the highest call, the most prestigious call, the most honorable call, the most humbling call, but preacher, it is also the most dangerous call. You have been called by God into the ministry and being called into the ministry, you are automatically thrust into the danger zone. The enemy of souls does not like you. In fact, he hates you. The enemy of our Christ wants to do one thing and that is to destroy God's witness. The way that dragon does this is to come at you with everything, including the kitchen sink. Be on guard It put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to deflect all of the shenanigans of the enemy. Concerning this movie, Tom Gunn, Tom Cruise was a pilot that flew by the seat of his pants. He toyed constantly with danger. He wanted so much to be the top gun, the top pilot. In his pursuit, he had gotten into an unrecoverable tailspin, which eventually got his reel killed because he wanted to lead instead of follow. He did not stay on his post. The death of his friend haunted him to the point that he dropped out of the Top Gun program. But after a visit and talk with a seasoned instructor, he decided to finish the school. He was not awarded Top Gun, but he finished. During the graduation, there was a situation that had developed. There were enemy jets in the area and the country needed America's best. So Iceman, played by Val Kilmer in his Rio, Maverick, who was Tom Cruise in his Rio, which would be assigned later, were submitted orders. Val and another team were to go out first. When they got into the air, it was discovered that there were a total of six MiG jets in the air. Val Kilmer's wingman was shot down, and now he was left alone to fight six enemy MiGs. The call went out to Tom Cruise to alert the fighter, the, to launch the alert fighter. Tom Cruise to go out to help Val. Tom takes off in blistering speed and rushes into the dogfight. While Tom was on his post, he encountered the same issue that got his first real kill, but this time he was on his assignment. Listen to me. You can be doing the right thing and still find yourself in trouble, preacher. So while Tom was in another tailspin, this time he recovered. Though he, rec he, though he recovered, PTSD was hitting him real hard at this time. And he disengaged, that is, he got out of the dogfight. After a brief moment, he re-engaged and was on his pilot's wing. In other words, Tom Cruise was on his assignment. He was on his post. While he re-engaged, his reel informed him that a Russian jet was getting on his tail and Tom needed to do something about it. Although the enemy was in hot pursuit and positioning himself to shoot down Tom out of the air, Tom Cruise said, quote, I am not leaving my wingman, close quote. Tom shot down two jets as well as Val Kilmer and the remaining two bugged out and so disaster was averted. 
Now earlier, when a guy got killed, his real, Tom wanted to leave. Tom wanted to do his own thing, but it brought nothing but disaster, so he quit. Now preacher, you may be upset with what's going on at your church. You may have quit your post, the wingman is to protect the leader and you have abandoned your position. Don't go looking elsewhere because you are upset that you are not leading or getting preaching assignments, etc. If you have bolted from your pastor, pray about returning. Go back and be your pastor's wingman.